Welcome to Beyond Distribution with GTDC. Today, we hear from Bob Skelly, Senior Vice President of Arctic Wolf, a market leader in security operations. Bob and Frank talk about how vendors and distributors help partners build stronger cybersecurity practices and the role distribution plays in demand creation, market expansion, and education. Get the answers to those questions and more in this episode of Beyond Distribution with GTDC. Thanks for listening. Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to the next episode of Beyond Distribution. Uh, I am thrilled today to have a good friend of mine uh, and the Senior Vice President of Channels for Arctic Wolf, Bob Skelly, joining us. Bob, good to see you. Thanks, Frank. Um, happy to be here and excited to have a chat today. Yeah, yeah, great. Thanks. And Bob recently joined our advisory council, and so he's been helping uh, GTDC, uh, certainly in North America, with uh, some advice and counsel on things that, you know, we need to continue to do, uh, you know, from a vendor standpoint. So, Bob, let me start, uh, you know, someplace that's near and dear to both of our hearts, uh, both being from Boston. We're both Boston sports fans. Uh, how are you feeling these days? Pretty good. Um, you know, right now, uh, very happy with uh, the basketball season and the results of, uh, of the Celtics championship. Nice to have a title back in Boston. Hope that my Patriots can get back on track. They're, uh, they're number one in my heart, but uh, obviously I love all the Boston sports. So uh, really excited about um, Monday, uh, last Monday's results and, you know, uh, and then, and the banner 18 for the Boston Celtics. Yeah, I mean, you and I could probably spend this whole podcast talking about that, but I'm sure that there'll be a lot of people that aren't interested, particularly our New York friends would not yeah. be really interested in hearing any more of it. I think right? they'd tune out pretty quickly if we went down that path, Frank. Yeah, yeah. So let's 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 uh, let's kind of digress and go back to uh, what we started, uh, which is. You know, you've got a pretty good resume, Bob, in, in you know, certainly IT and, and for sure in channels um, and having served in a number of different roles. You know, certainly you and I worked together at at uh, Dell. Uh, I know you were at Microsoft. I know you're at Equalogic. I know you ran TCC for a while. Um, talk a little bit about how you got started in IT and, you know, a little bit about your journey and some of the things that were important to you. Yeah, a little bit of an unconventional path, I think. Um, you know, I was doing uh, factory automation and laboratory equipment sales for the first 10 years of my career. Uh, I was in a national uh, sales leadership role uh, with that company and just was, you know, wanted to get into technology and um, into a more progressive growth industry. And, uh, you know, I had a lot of experience with OEMs at the time, that, that uh, original equipment manufacturer, you know, acronym. And, Microsoft picked that up in my resume. I got an opportunity to interview with them and I convinced them to take a chance on a guy with that uh, really didn't have any technology experience, but I had to take a complete reset on my career. I went back to the very beginning, took about a 50% pay cut. Um, I was in their system builder channel uh, where we called on small computer uh, manufacturers that uh, many of which were pirating software and not playing by the rules. And our job was to build relationship, get them to play by the rules, get them to, you know, really work closely with Microsoft, install our software the proper way. And sometimes that went really well. And sometimes that got really ugly, mm. as you would imagine. But uh, yeah, it was it was a great career journey. Luckily, I had a, a guy who took a chance on me, hired me and really uh, helped me progress my career, gave me opportunities, uh, moved me along through the company. And he's actually now one of the senior uh, channel executives at uh, at Cisco. Um, he stayed at Microsoft for a long time after I left, but is now with Cisco in a, in a CETA leader leadership role. So Rodney, if you're out there listening, uh, thanks for uh, thanks for the original break in IT. Yeah, you know that uh, that's interesting because we we've all had mentors like that that have uh, that have you know kind of helped us, and um, it it matters it matters a lot. So Bob, you. Um, you, I know you were with a company that was acquired. I guess it was Equalogic back in the day, yeah, right? That's right. Um, and obviously, in the IT space, that happens a lot, right? And and you know, we've actually we've got a couple of major acquisitions currently kind of in process, right? When when you think about the 
Cisco Splunk uh, scenario, certainly Broadcom VMware, and uh, which is kind of done. Uh, but uh, and then of course now HPE uh, slash Aruba with Juniper, right? Which is you know near and dear to my heart, having worked for right. Juniper for a long time. But um, in your experience, uh, you know, kind of what works? What you know? What what, what have you seen in the integration space uh, for IT companies that? Seems to make sense. What what are some of the things that you would you know you would consider as key important? Well, I think you know first and foremost is to have a roadmap toward a, an actual integration of the of the companies as much as possible, right? Sometimes the technologies are just never going to marry. They're built on uh, code or foundations or platforms that just aren't going to integrate, and so they may have to operate as a uh, independent technology within the same framework, but but programs and uh, and things of that nature can be integrated in in every case. And so I think um, having a roadmap on how you're going to bring those programs together, how are you going to make sure that you embrace uh, from a channel perspective, embrace the channel community, that ecosystem as as one entity, not as separate programs and separate channel organizations. You have to really bring all that together. And that means sometimes in the back end doing things like uh, consolidating Salesforce and making sure there's a single instance uh, and doing some of that back end uh, software uh, work that that assures that you're operating as one one unit, one team. Um, so I think that's key. And then, you know, for me, it was, you know, really communication constantly with the legacy partner community, as well as the new partners that you're bringing into into the fold. I think you really got to keep them uh, informed and communicate more than you think you have to. Uh, I've often said we get tired of our own voice before anyone hears it. And so you got to repeat things and you got to tell them things over and over again, and you got to make sure they understand where you're headed and where their place is going to be uh, in, in your channel program and in your channel ecosystem. Yeah, that's really important because, um, you know, the truth of the matter is in a lot of cases, the channel partners of the of whatever entities are coming together tend to get um, impacted quite significantly, you know, because of merging programs, uh, because of different philosophies, you know, perhaps in, in the way things are approached. And uh, we've both seen that happen, uh, sometimes good, sometimes not so good. Yeah, for sure. I remember, Frank, when we were over at Dell and, and um, when we uh, acquired a company called Compellent, the first thing we did was we looked at their advisory board and we said, okay, how are we going to incorporate them into the existing Dell advisory board so that we're embracing, you know, those voices and, and listening to what they have to say? Yeah, yeah, no, that's good. That That's really good. So, so Bob, um, you know, your role here in Arctic Wolf is uh, probably what, year and a half, maybe two years you've been there now? I've actually been there coming up on four, Frank, believe it is or it not. Is it that long? Okay, yeah. I kind of yeah, lost I moved track. In I did move into a channel strategy, global channel strategy role from um, a global channel uh, role. So taking a little bit tact over the last year and a half and added distribution uh, to uh, to that uh, more recently. So, yeah. yeah. So you've got overall responsibility for uh, channel strategy, channel operations, et cetera. Yep. Channel development, uh, you know, especially if we do, you know, the comment on acquisitions is near and dear, you know, as we acquire new companies, you know, bringing those programs into our existing program, working with the new entity to make sure those partners have a home and, and that we have a, a channel program for that new solution is, is part of what I do. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. That's good. Cause it's good to have somebody that kind of understands, you know, a lot of people don't realize how, how much thought needs to go into, um, building a channel program, developing a channel program, because they've never been on the other end of it. And they don't realize, um, you know, the implications of, yeah, let's go just do this and how that plays out, you know, with their, with their partners. Uh, and yeah. that's a problem, right? Sure. Yeah, yeah, it really is. And especially in a global arena, right? So we expanded globally about four years ago and, um, you know, now we have to think about everything we do with that lens, and it's it's not always easy. Yeah, yeah, no, I totally agree. So, you Bob, for years you've worked closely with distribution. Uh, I I know that. Um, you know, certainly in in many of the roles you had, I know that when we were together at at Dell, um, 
we spent a lot of time back then trying to accelerate, you know, Dell's path into distribution, which frankly has happened. And, and you know, um, the folks I talk to uh, both on both sides uh, feel like, you know, Dell has made great progress, uh, you know, in that in that area. But from your standpoint, particularly now, as you're building out, you know, the program and as Arctic Wolf is emerging, what are you relying on distribution for and why are, you know, what are some of the decisions that you're making uh, relative to how that works um, important? Yeah, um, you know, we're relying on them for a lot of things. Um, and, and what's interesting about the distribution ecosystem in general is their, their ability to evolve. I mean, Frank, we've both seen it over the years, the ability for distribution partners to understand what vendors need and how their needs are changing and then evolving their own businesses in order to support that. I mean, think about 10 years ago, software as a service wasn't mainstream. Now, you know, every company is a SaaS company and, and how is distribution no longer taking physical assets, no longer managing that side of it? How are they still adding value? And for us, there's a whole bunch of ways that we get value. There's partner recruitment, helping us match up to the right types of partners that are a fit for us. There's partner enablement, um, helping us with um, demand generation campaigns in some cases, um, technical enablement, helping us with uh, technical workshops. Um, and then on the transactional side, there's still value they're bringing there too. Like uh, when we have a very complex deal, let's say we don't want to bill monthly, uh, the distribution partner can help us uh, execute on that monthly billing or uh, currency exchanges in foreign countries. So there's tremendous um, value in the relationship that we have and uh, and our distribution partner is always willing to try different things, listen to our ideas, come up with solutions and and help us navigate some difficult problems. Yeah, you know, Bob, we spent I think you were at you were at our event certainly this year in uh, in February, the GTDC North America event and you know, we spent some time talking about it uh, on stage in a variety of different different sessions. But um, one of the things that I think happens a lot in the distribution world is a lot of the things you just mentioned, kind of the basics, uh, you know, I call them, um, I think kind of get taken for granted because, you know, they've been doing them for so long and they've been doing them at scale for so long that people just assume, well, I, it, it, one, it needs to be done, and boy, anybody can do it, <laughs> which you and I both know isn't the case, right? Uh, uh, certainly, having been with a couple of uh, vendors who tried to do it direct, we realized we couldn't do it, right? Uh, yeah, for sure. I'm sure you've seen that. Yeah. Um, the other thing that that we also talked a little bit about when we were together in, in February was the notion, uh, what you brought up about the constant evolution that's been required, right? And so the distributors have had no choice. I mean, they've had to morph their business because of the initiatives that are being driven, you know, from the customer back, right, if you will. So the idea of SaaS, the idea of consumption models, you know, that those are driven through customer needs because those are the things that customers want and, 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 and need to have. The thing that surprises me, and I'd be interested in your point on, your thoughts on this is, what I've been surprised that distributors have been able to do over the years as they've morphed, morphed their business, still run the, the core functions that they've always been very good at, you, which you mentioned, but also did a really good job of keeping their customers happy and satisfied. And we, we had some survey work that we showed at our, our event, which showed that I think it was 89% of the solution providers um, graded their distrib distribution relationships as uh, positive or very positive. And that to me is probably from a vendor perspective when, you know, when I had the roles that you're in now, I, that to me was the most significant part, I thought. Without a doubt. I mean, you, you know, if you're working through a distribution partnership and you have an NPS score that's dramatically different than, than partners you're working with directly, that that's a problem, right? So, um, and we've seen, uh, the distribution partners and and we we do a general NPS score uh, for all partners whether they're working through distribution or not and the ones who aren't are just because they were legacy before we signed our distribution partnership uh, so everybody new goes through distribution and then we can look at that by the the relationship type that they uh, that they have are they through distribution are they direct with us which dis distribution partner do they work with 
And what we're seeing is a really consistent uh, net promoter score for partners that are uh, working with distribution or direct. And in some cases, we see other attributes that are even better, like our net retention mm. through distribution is actually slightly better uh, mm. than, than partners that aren't through distribution. So things like that are a really important I indication of the health of your, your channel through distribution. Yeah, yeah, and you and you're measuring all that on a regular basis, huh? Yeah, we do. We we uh, we we rotate through. We're pretty much twice a year. Every partner gets that survey, but yeah. we do a quarterly survey, and it's just a different segment of partners each time. Yeah, you mentioned you mentioned global, uh, Bob, earlier, and some of the challenges that you know you have doing business globally, and certainly you guys are are expanding uh, and have expanded. Um, what's your take there? What are some of the things that you're seeing globally that, um, you know, Disney's helping you with? Yeah, so we're just embarking on our distribution journey in, uh, in Europe, in EMEA. Mm -hmm. yep. um, uh, we, we just signed our first two distribution relationships, one to cover the Nordics and one to cover Ireland. Yep. Um, and we needed that for a lot of the same reasons I mentioned earlier other uh, relationships that they bring to the table. You can't always count on your sales and channel team to, you know, have the relationships and the, um, you know, the network uh, that you need to build a channel ecosystem the way you do. Um, but there's also, you know, distribution or not, there's cultural challenges that we're always faced with when we work globally, right? No matter how much we talk about it and how much we understand that, it's still hard, right? Yeah. Um, you know, if I try and build a program, uh, um, and, uh, you know, I'm only thinking about my U.S. channel and my U.S. distribution network, then I have issues with, you know, how the program program's consumed, what the training looks like, the content, everything. And it can be basic things like translation, right? Sure, everybody knows that. But even from, you know, forget you to me, uh, Germany, U.K., very different. Yeah. Go a little bit more granular. Germany... Northern Germany is completely different than southeastern Germany near the Australian Austria border, right? So if you don't have a real sense for those cultural nuances, you're never going to be successful with your channel program there. And we're going to be counting on, uh, yes, our team locally for sure, but our distribution relationships as we bring them on to help us navigate some of that and to help us localize, if you will, the flavor of the program and how we spin that program in the local geographies so that it resonates with partners in, in you know, whether they're speaking German or whether they're in Benelux or whether they're in Ireland or the Nordics. Yeah, you know, it's kind of funny, Bob, uh, over the years, and you and I have been involved in lots of programs over the years, uh, some we built together, uh, you know, while at Dell and, and some we've watched, you know, play out in the marketplace when we've been in a, very pla a variety of different places. But the thing that's amazing to me is, as much as, you know, the technology has evolved, as much as, you know, we're seeing all kinds of innovative enhancements, you know, in a lot of places, channel programs still remain pretty fundamental and pretty basic, right? I mean, it, it really doesn't have to be that complicated. In fact, it's better if it's not, right? That, absolutely. I mean, that, you know, you're, 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 uh, you're hitting the core of it, right? If you get too complex, partners are going to tune out. Yeah. And, um, you know, for example, we just introduced uh, a rebate for our partners, for our top tier partners, our gold partners and our MSPs. We just introduced it in this new fiscal year. We're, and uh, and so that's an exciting new benefit. But we had to make it really simple. I didn't want a, a rebate program that had complex computations and how do I figure out if I'm getting paid and, you know, what I'm going to make. Right. So, you know, at the end of the day, I mean, the partners want to, you know, they're we, we can't forget that they're managing multiple relationships, yep. no matter what. Even if they're a best of breed solution provider that's chosen to pick one in each category, there's still going to be 10, 15 partnerships that they're navigating at any given day. And so you can't have a lot of complexity in your program, the training requirements, how you structure your rebate programs. You still need to stick to some fundamentals that, you know, make it easy to do business with. Yeah. 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 You know, and I talk about that a lot, <clears throat> you know, over the years, that mantra of being easy to do business with from a vendor standpoint has remained like one of the top, you know, items along with product quality and, you know, things like that. But 
But the problem, the thing about easy to do business with that people don't understand is it's a constant journey. It never ends because you can master something at some point and then next week announce a new program and screw up your easy to do business with, you know, uh, 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 mantra, right? And so it you got to keep that in the forefront uh, all the time. Absolutely. And you have to be listening to your partners if you're going to even understand that, right? Like when you're in your own forest, right? You don't necessarily see what's going around and, you know, you don't understand how complex things are. You have to get outside your forest and you got to go talk to those partners and say, you know, is this easy? Does it make sense? Does it help your business? Right. Do you understand how it works? And if you're not constantly getting that feedback um, and that's why I think a partner advisory council is so critical and and not as just a check the box. I've got a council. It's as a listening vehicle as a way to gather feedback, as a way to identify issues before they become bigger, and then doing something about those things. Uh, you know, partner advisory councils can serve a critical role uh, in making sure that you're always, you know, keeping an eye on ease of doing business and all the other critical things you need to worry about. Yeah, plus it also, plus it also um, provides a degree of loyalty with those partners because if they feel like you're listening, if they feel like they're plugged in, and they have a voice in what you're doing. Um, you get you get some loyalty out of that, which which is critical for for anybody, you know, building a relationship. Yeah. Right? Indeed, yeah, for sure. Yep. Yeah. So, Bob, uh, let's talk a little bit of cybersecurity. Obviously, it continues to be a you know a <laughs> at the top um, of of you know what everybody's thinking about relative to running a business, uh, and um, and certainly since the pandemic. Um, it's even become more, you know, more critical. What are some of the latest threats that, you know, the partners are facing and addressing? And, you know, what are some of the things you guys are doing to help that? Yeah, you know, uh, it, it's a challenging space because threat actors are constantly evolving. They change tactics sometimes, you know, week to week. Yeah. Um, even, you know, ransomware techniques that they may have used uh, historically, they, they, you know, understand that those aren't effective any longer and they, you know, they pivot. AI is, you know, I know it's a buzzword everybody's using, but threat actors are all over leveraging AI to improve their ability to social engineer. Um, you know, they're still coming at the end user as a primary, uh, you know, weakness within the threat defense. So phishing, smishing, vishing, you know, social engineering, getting the credentials of that one person who makes a mistake, makes the wrong click. And then, you know, sometimes lingering in that environment for weeks or months, even learning, finding, you know, back doors, creating back doors, writing code within the system so that they have access to things before they ever expose themselves uh, inside the network. And so that constant evolution uh, by the threat actor requires constant evolution by the security vendors as well. You have to be looking for the latest threats identifying them quickly and uh, understanding how you're going to prevent those uh, on a broad scale. Um, yeah. But AI is going to make it in increasingly more difficult. Um, and so you have to use AI in, in a positive way in order to, you know, thwart some of the, uh, the ways it'll be used by the threat actors. Yeah. That's kind of an interesting thought. Uh, Cause you, you're right. A, the, you know, AI is, AI is going to be used by anybody for any scenario, and the, hopefully the good guys figure out the most efficient ways <laughs> versus the bad guys, right? Yeah. Uh, you worry about it, though. I mean, you know, I recently finished Elon Musk's book, uh, and boy, I'll tell you, he is he is really vocal about the fact that he's concerned that you know AI could do more harm than good if we don't if we don't harness it properly. And, you know, if he's concerned, we all ought to be concerned. And that, that's my take, right? Totally agree. I, I am. I'm, yeah. I'm very concerned um, yeah. that threat actors will use AI more effectively than we will to defend. Yeah, 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 exactly. Um, so uh, closing up here, Bob, a couple of just a quick tell me about I know you guys just kicked off your, you know, new fiscal year. I think I think you I think it's May. Uh, 
and um, you've got a lot of activity going, I'm sure, with the channel. You, you mentioned you're expanding, you know, globally, you're bringing in disties in. So tell me some of the things that, you know, you guys are doing and some things that people really should understand and either your existing partners or prospective partners should should know what to expect from you guys. Yeah, well, well, uh, you're right, Frank. We kick off our uh, year on May 1st, and then we have uh, what we call Partner Jam. Um, and that just, um, it's actually concluding this week, but the the brunt of it is uh, last week, uh, uh, on the week of June 10th. And and what that is, is everybody in the company, we're 100% channel uh, go-to-market, right? So everybody from our CEO down to every person in the organization is always thinking channel. And so everybody across the company was in front of partners on uh, in partner meetings, at partner events, doing enablement sessions, helping them understand what was new with Arctic Wolf for uh, our fiscal year 25, which started on May 1st. Um, really, you know, getting that word out in front of our partner community, listening to feedback, identifying areas where we can improve, um, all of that, right? But, when, you know, we did a lot of new things too. We've got tons of product stuff that our partners uh, need to go uh, check out and, and there's all sorts of on-demand videos that we did to help them and enable them on that. Uh, I mentioned earlier, we're introducing a rebate to our gold partner, uh, uh, gold partners um, in this fiscal year. So if you're a partner with, uh, with Arctic Wolf today, you know, get to gold, earn your rebates and be part of that program. Um, we expanded some other benefits. For example, we have a managed awareness uh, product, which is, you know, I mentioned the user and getting mm. fished mm. and all that. Well, key to that is education and education has to be constant. It can't be a, we have a compliance check in the box. We got to train all our employees on an annual basis. That doesn't work. You know, you got to do it every, you know, week, every two weeks, constant consumable, short reinforcement of the right behaviors. And so that managed awareness product, we're giving to all of our golden uh, gold partners um, for no cost so they can wow. deploy it in their own organization. It's as a new gold benefit uh, for our partners. So that's a big one that the partners can begin taking advantage of as well. And does that help? That helps the partner uh, within their own organization have uh, and their employees have awareness on the things they should be looking for or looking out for, or making sure that, you know, they avoid, you know, traps that, that they can easily fall into. Yeah. yeah, that's exactly right, right? You know, we have to start with our own house and make yeah. sure that we're, you know, protecting it and, and not uh, stepping into, uh, you know, links or phishing schemes that, that could compromise the organization. And you know what, by doing that, by having that internally, you know, there's a benefit to us too, let's face it, right? They understand the product, they have their hands on it, Arctic Wolf's brand is in front of them on a regular basis, training them on what to be looking out for. And and they're probably going to go out and sell some of that to their customers when they see how good it is, too. Yeah, yeah, totally. No, that's a great idea. That that that's that's really a good idea. Well, good. Well, Bob, look, it's been great catching up. Uh, I know we see each other frequently, you know, in the field at at, ver at a variety of different events, and uh, and that's good. Um, uh, you know, I know you're excited and have been, you know, in this in this role, and I think it's a perfect, you know, perfect opportunity and. Uh, you guys are doing great. So it was good, uh, good catching up. Any, any last thoughts, any other final comments before we close? Um, just, you know, on that security, it's a continuous journey, Frank. You mentioned it, right? The threat actors are always involving. We always have to, too. And, you know, partners need to be setting a course for their customers on where they want to take them in their security journey and, you know, laying it out for them piece by piece. Here's what we're going to do this quarter. Here's what we're going to do next quarter. There's great service opportunities for uh, for partners if they're doing that the right way both organic services that they may be delivering and then things that they can sell throughout the various vendor relationships that they have so don't stop that journey it has to be a constant evolution of your of your security posture and uh, and if you do that you're going to be serving your customers best interests around outcomes that that they're looking for yeah. but Frank thank you um, so much for having me today I really enjoyed the conversation and uh, Love the GTDC event and and uh, look forward to future ones. Yeah, and thanks again. And, and we'll be together soon at some GTDC. We'll probably have our advisory council here coming up soon, uh, working on some dates. So look forward to seeing you then. And so with that, thanks, Bob. Continued good luck. Thank you.